hello. Uh, as uh, you just heard, we are going to speak about uh, uh, scalable ETS. And what we mean with that is uh, uh, how well ETS scales when uh, uh, several processes access ETS on a multi-core machine. We uh, are coming from Uppsala University. And uh, we are working uh, with uh, our supervisor, Kostis Saganos. So just briefly, because I think uh, most of you already know what ETS is. Um, ETS stands for Erlang Term Storage. And it's a key value stores. And the keys and, and the value are stored in a, a tuple. So one element in this tuple is the key, and the rest of the tuple is the value. And um, uh, it supports uh, operations such as uh, lookup, insert, delete, and uh, uh, queries that uh, return a list of all uh, tuples that match a uh, specified uh, pattern. And uh, ETS is used uh, in Mnesia, uh, distributed database that is included in the OTP. And you, you can look at ETS as uh, in-memory uh, database tables. And uh, a short example of how ETS is used. Um, the ETS new call is used to create an ETS table. The first argument is an uh, atom uh, that uh, can be used as an identifier of the table, but only if uh, uh, you say that it's a name table in the settings list. That is the second argument. And um, uh, you can uh, specify a table type. And the, the full table type is set. And then uh, all keys in the table uh, are unique. And in bag, you can have uh, tuples with uh, the same key in the table, and duplicate bag, then you can even have uh, duplicates of tuples in the table. Ordered set is the same as set, but uh, then there is also an uh, order between the elements. So if you uh, traverse all elements in the table, you will get them in the um, uh, Erlang term order uh, of the keys. And uh, you can have uh, different protection modes. So public means that uh, uh, all processes in the uh, Erlang node uh, can um, access and uh, modify and read from the table. Protected mean, means that the owning process can uh, write to it, but uh, all other processes in the system uh, can read. And private, then uh, um, only the owning process can see it. And this uh, key post, uh, setting is uh, you can specify which element in the tuple uh, contains the key. And this uh, write concurrency and read concurrency options um, is uh, fine tuning uh, options uh, when you are running on a uh, multi core machine and have uh, shared uh, tables. Um, and uh, oh, here is, are some examples of operations. When you insert, you or you call um, an ETS operation, you, um, <coughs> you give the, uh, the function the table identifier, and uh, uh, in the insert you give it a, a tuple that you're going to insert, and look up uh, the, the key that you want to look up. So uh, we think uh, ETS is uh, important for Erlang, um, we searched 190 uh, open source projects, and uh, uh, out of them, we found that uh, f at least uh, 41 use shared uh, ETS tables. And uh, you can take these numbers with a grain of salt because, uh, um, yeah, for example, if uh, a library uses an uh, ETS table and the source of the library is not uh, included in the repository, then you will not see it here. But I can just uh, ask you, how many of you uh, are using shared uh, ETS tables? 
Yeah, so it's quite a few, almost uh, half of you. I think it was more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why is Ads so popular? We think there are two major reasons. One is convenience, that Ads provide a, a way to do a frequently uh, used uh, task in a standard way, and it's easy to use. And also for performance reasons, uh, ETS is implemented in C and uh, make use of mutable data, so it will be difficult to implement something with the same performance uh, with a, a pure Erlang implementation. And uh, it's also scalable on uh, multi-core systems, but uh, we have a question mark there because we will uh, show later uh, how scalable it is. So when you are uh, programming with Erlang, you have two ways of uh, communicating between processes, or two main way, ways. Uh, uh, one is message passing, um, and uh, uh, that can be a problem for some applications. For example, if you have uh, uh, a process that has the, like the sole purpose is to provide uh, data to other processes, uh, then it can become a scalability bottleneck because uh, that process can only serve one other process at a time. And you, yeah, there are ways to get around it. You can uh, divide the data between several processes and so on. But uh, instead, you can uh, use a shared ETS table to do the communication. Um, and uh, then uh, processes can ac access the its table in parallel, or uh, can it? We will uh, try to, to investigate this question. So what kind of systems do we want uh, ETS to scale on? Um, SMP means uh, symmetric multiprocessing, and uh, uh, you, yeah, normally what you mean with that is uh, um, a single chip with multiple cores, and uh, then we have a relatively cheap communication between the cores on the system, and uh, NUMA, non-uniform memory access systems, and uh, in such a system you have several processor chips, uh, possibly with, with uh, many cores in each chip, so then you have uh, cheap communications between the cores in the same chip, but uh, uh, comparable, very expensive communication between the ships. So you have to think about this when you uh, are designing a scalable ETS implementation. So just briefly, like how uh, ETS is implemented. Um, you, you, uh, as you saw, you get an identifier from the ETS new uh, function, and um, uh, this identifier is uh, used uh, in um, uh, the operations to get the ETS table. Uh, so you have a meta table containing mappings from uh, the table identifier to the table data. And this, uh, in the current implementation, this meta table is uh, protected by a, a couple of blocks. So uh, each slot in the meta table uh, has a lock, a reader-writer lock, that you need uh, to take to make sure that the table is not uh, deleted by another process, for example. Um, so there is in this uh, meta table slots, there are also uh, a flag that says that uh, oh, this slot is currently alive or dead. So when you have the uh, taking the reader lock of the, of the corresponding uh, table, uh, meta table slot lock, then you can check if the, uh, the table is alive and you can read uh, the table data. And uh, oh, the meta name table is the corresponding table to me meta table, but for named tables. And, uh, uh, the backend uh, data structure for ordered set it's AVL tree, and the hash table for set, bag, and duplicate bag. 
the OVL tree is a balanced binary search tree. And uh, that one doesn't have any fine-grained locking, so it's protected by a single reader-writer lock. And uh, the linear hash table is a hash table with... Um, so every bucket in the hash table is a linked list containing the elements that are stored in, the, in this bucket. And um, uh, resizing is done uh, one element at a time uh, in such a way that it tries to maintain average bucket length uh, in R16B6, uh, but uh, our science, uh, only one uh, process can uh, or Fred can grow or shrink the table at the same time. Uh, there might be larger uh, bucket lengths. And uh, the linear hash table, uh, by default, it has uh, a single reader-writer lock to protect uh, the table for concurrent access, but uh, it also supports fine-grained uh, locking. Uh, but there are some operations, such as uh, uh, atomically inserting all elements in a list, uh, that still take the, uh, the uh, global table lock. And uh, you could uh, uh, get rid of the global table lock by taking all the, the necessary uh, bucket locks, but uh, that will probably not be so performant. So, uh, write concurrency is uh, activated with, with this uh, uh, write concurrency setting that you uh, specify when you create a table. And uh, this option was introduced in uh, OTP version R13B02. And uh, originally it was, uh, or initially, it was uh, 16 uh, bucket locks but it was increased uh, in R16B. Uh, we spoke to the OTP team and then oh, said that, uh, that we have found like in a benchmark that uh, it worked better with more bucket locks and then in the next version we had 64 bucket locks. And I, I'm going to take you through an example of what is happening uh, when you have activated write concurrency in a, uh, set table. So initially, you don't have any other processes working with uh, uh, any table, so all uh, locks are uh, open. And uh, we want to access uh, the table with uh, uh, ID 257. So uh, we take the corresponding meta table lock for reading, and we see that uh, this table is alive, and then we can take the, uh, the table lock also for reading, so we can allow uh, concurrent writes to the table, and then we find, uh, uh, we, uh, first of all, we, uh, we release the meta table uh, lock, then we find the bucket, and we need to take uh, the bucket lock for writing, since it's um, um, yeah modifying operation. And then we insert uh, uh, the element into the bucket, and then finally we can release the bucket lock and the uh, table lock. So now uh, David is going to uh, take over and speak about uh, the. Uh, read concurrency option. Okay, so uh, we have seen a lot of locks right now, so I will quickly explain how reader-writer locks work on a more abstract level. Essentially, a writer is taking your mutual exclusion lock as you would expect, and for convenience of thinking about it, you can imagine that a reader is simply increasing a counter if the lock is free, and decrements that counter again when it's done with reading, and anyone who writes after locking the mutual exclusion lock will have to wait for that counter to reach zero again. That means it's probably slightly more expensive to do writes, but you can do reads in parallel. 
Um, the read concurrency option was introduced in R14b, and it's, it is an optimization to these reader-writer logs. So it maps, instead of all the readers to a single counter, maps them to reader groups where each group shares a counter. And normally what you will end up with is that you get one Erlang scheduler per reader group, so they just have a counter that counts zero or one. Um, yeah, you want to do that because reads should really be fast. And a fast write is a write in, on modern computers in the local cache. And if you have many, many cores that access the same counter, they will actually invalidate each other's caches. So you have to split that out a little bit so to avoid the cost of invalidating the cache lines all the time. And because you fetch cache lines, you actually have to make the counter 64 bytes so that it occupies the entire cache line. You don't use all of this memory, you just have to pad it a little bit. Um, so where does this cost come from? Um, modern, bigger machines um, usually are not SMP anymore. My home computer is an SMP machine with a single processor chip. But bigger servers today have multiple sockets and many, many cores. And the problem there is that if the uh, reader groups are laid out, they will be cached quite friendly so that every core gets its own one locally cached. Now, if they had to share, for example, between core 0 and core 4, the invalidation would not even be within a single chip, but would have to traverse the interconnect between several chips. And that would happen every single time one of these cores does a read on an ETS table. And these invalidations get really expensive really quickly, so reader groups help a lot in that regard. Uh, yeah, the maximum amount of reader groups in R16B is 64 if you have even more schedulers running. By default, you have as many schedulers as cores in your system. Then they will share counters. Up to 64 cores, you should be fine right now. And uh, we will discuss this later when we see some performance graphs. So let's sum this up again. Uh, write concurrency is working only on those tables that are based on hash tables, so set bag and duplicate bag, and you get 64 bucket locks right now. Uh, these bucket locks do not have reader groups, and only if you also set read concurrency on the table, then these bucket locks get reader groups. On the other hand, the main table lock always gets reader groups, no matter whether you specify read concurrency or not. When you have write concurrency, you get reader groups on the main table lock. It's, it's not really useful to have a main table lock and bucket locks, and the main table lock is then the bottleneck. If you just specify read concurrency, you get the reader groups on all table types. That's what it does. Uh, yeah, so let's look at some benchmarks for running all this. So the benchmark we used does some warm-up initializing the table with 1 million inserts on a key range of 4 million, and then does 4 million operations. No, it's 2 million key range, sorry. Um, 4 million operations uh, we have doing only lookups and doing 90% lookups and 10% updates, and updates are deletes and inserts with equal probability so that it stays about the same size. Uh, we have bound all the schedulers to cores so that they are not moved around by the operating system. You can do that by specifying a runtime option to Erlang. And it's just a command line parameter, and uh, we will discuss why this is, in, is uh, useful. And for the graphs on the x-axis, you see just the amount of schedulers we use, and on the y-axis, time in seconds. So it's time, not uh, throughput. So first, let's see how much better it already got. Good news. Um, the first thing we have is R11B, which was the first SMP-enabled Erlang runtime system. Uh, R13B02 got write concurrency, R14B for read concurrency, and R16B because it is what we currently have. So 
yeah, this is running on um, Intel Sandy Bridge single chip uh, with eight cores. Hyperthreading is not used. So these are real eight cores. And as you can see, uh, R11B is the red line. It didn't work very well initially. Uh, with R13B, it got better. This is a benchmark only doing lookups. So the write concurrency didn't really have anything to do with this. This is having a new locking library and optimizing that a little bit as well. And uh, the current versions perform rather similar and looking good on this graph. Up to eight cores looks nice. So for this is, I only benchmark, for all the benchmarks here show either set or ordered set, unless I say something else. I will say what it is, but the set is representative for bag and duplicate bag as well, in case you're wondering. So ordered set looks pretty much the same. Not a huge difference at all. But once we run this on more than a single processor chip, the picture looks slightly different. This is still ordered set, still only doing lookups. And what we can see here is that once you have more than eight schedulers, we do no longer bind that to a single chip. It spreads out over multiple chips. And this suddenly has a cost. And it gets slower again. And for all of them, <laughs> even the current ones. So that's something we will soon see how that can happen. Uh, the good news is for set, the new versions actually do not have the problem. They don't get much faster anymore, but at least they don't get slower. Um, yeah, so we had a look into ordered set, what is causing this, and patched it a little bit to avoid some cache line invalidations within the AVL tree's um, search operation in the tree. And uh, as you can see, there is this Cyan line down there, which is the patched ordered set with read concurrency. And it now is even faster than a lookup on a read write concurrent set. Uh, this patch will probably not be in the next release, but a very similar one, I hope, will make it into it. This one has some downsides. I just quickly patched it up. It's a two line patch. It really hurts when you uh, traverse the entire tree. So that's why there is a little bit more work required. Um, what's also interesting, in my opinion, is, is that you can see cache line invalidations very quickly bring you to, to the level of performance of not having read concurrency. That's always the same, roughly the same amount of performance you get. So adding updates. <laughs> when operating on set, we can see that not a lot changes. The old versions get even worse, and the new versions don't work as well anymore. They get slower when using multiple processor chips, unfortunately, but not by a lot. R16B pretty much is stable. You don't benefit from using multiple chips, unfortunately. But if, if we do other things, you might still benefit from it. So these benchmarks are really doing nothing but ETS operations. It might be not your average workload. Um, yeah, doing this on ordered set, however, is somewhat painful. Here we can see that it, yeah, obviously on the old versions doesn't work at all. Interestingly enough, R13B is much worse than R11B. And um, yeah, R16B is worse than R14B. <laughs> and what we see here is for, um, I don't exactly know where this comes from. That it gets more expensive after eight cores is uh, the NUMA effect of having multiple processor chips. And some things really have a problem in performance in ordered set when you do parallel operations that do updates. This is somewhat expected. It doesn't have fine-grained locking after all. So you do access one big fat lock. So Let's look at what really is due to these concurrency options. The options you have is not setting them, or setting read concurrency, setting write concurrency, or setting them both. And for R16B, what you get is a level of performance where um, 
yeah, the interesting parts here are the uh, green line and the red line, where you see without setting these options, it's not as bad as you might expect on a single chip, but as soon as you leave one chip, you absolutely lose any kind of performance you might have had. And that is exactly why you should use pinning, uh, because then, at least if it stays on a, on a single chip, you gain much better performance. And when the operating system is free to reschedule your things, you just get more of these traversals in memory. So usually you get the worst case all the time. <laughs> um, the blue line with the circle um, is ordered set, which has the bug already described. So it would be slightly better if that was fixed already. And the other interesting thing, it's somewhat hard to see here, is that the best line on 32 cores is actually set with read concurrency. The benchmark is doing only lookups, so that's the best thing you can do. If you only do lookups, you don't set write concurrency, you just set read concurrency. It's somewhat obvious, but here you can actually see the cost of enabling these bucket locks, and then you have to take them for reading as well, of course. Um, yeah, with updates, things hurt. <laughs> uh, just setting read concurrency and using updates and reads in parallel results in the top two lines for set and ordered set. So as soon as you get updates into the picture and you don't only read, just setting read concurrency will hurt your performance. This is something you should consider, even if you have very little updates, 10% is a lot. But even if it's much less, you will see this effect. And if you really think, I have so few updates, you should measure. It's really, even with less than 1% updates, quite measurable. Um, with no locking, you gain better performance than that. <laughs> and with read-write concurrent uh, sets, or just write concurrent sets, you gain fairly similar performance. Now, that's interesting because only one of them has reader groups on the bucket locks, right? So reader groups can be, you can set a limit on the command line. The default is 64. And uh, the real maximum number of reader groups you get is the number of schedulers or the number you specify on the command line or 64. So you can override the 64, but if you only have eight schedulers, you get eight reader groups. There is no sense in having more than that. And it's, yeah, an optimization for reads. So we just ran it with different amounts of reader groups. And what we can see is on 32 cores, well, having a single reader group hurts. Having two reader groups is already relatively good. This is nice. This is uh, running on read-write concurrent sets. And between four and 64 reader groups, there is not a huge difference. So this isn't fully investigated, but the current uh, theory behind it is that this is a four-socket machine, and so with four reader groups, you already gain most of the benefit. Still, there is quite a large difference. It's just on this scale not really that visible. Uh, you do gain benefits from having more reader groups. They're just not as visible as just blowing up your runtime a lot. Um, it could still be arguable whether we need 64, really. Um, for ordered set, it looks pretty much the same, just that we have additional performance problems in ordered set, as discussed previously. And these Low outliers here are pretty much the randomness because the cache line invalidations in ordered set are not deterministic. So when adding updates again, here we can finally see what the cost of having more reader groups is. If you have them, you actually have to check them. And here we see that if you have to check them and they are on multiple chips, you really lose a lot of performance and this 
sequential case three seconds benchmark can take more than 17 seconds. Uh, that's not the kind of thing you want to happen when parallelizing your applications, I hope. Um, yeah, that's reader groups. So the defaults should be fairly sensible, but you can play around with it if you really have to save memory, something like that. Um, the number of bucket locks, as we said earlier, was recently changed. And it's a compile time constant, so you cannot specify it on the command line. It's 64 now. So let's hope it was really important, right? Um, on 10% updates again, we see that with a single lock, it stops scaling even on eight cores pretty quickly. This is eight cores again. Uh, and we see that it gets better and better, and with 16 <coughs> locks, we pretty much have the performance we can get, right? So, as one would expect by now, using multiple chips, it starts hurting, and we need more of these. And that's, in the end, the reason why we wanted this to be increased. And this is just using 10% updates on the operations. 90% of your operations still are lookups. If you now use more updates, if you just batch write to an ETS table from some parallel application, this is much, much more uh, problematic, and 64 is maybe not even enough to gain the best of performance, but on the other hand, uh, you can't just use... Uh, actually, there's a problem in the code, you can't use more than 256. Uh, <laughs> and also, as you use memory for these locks, and uh, for every one of these buckets locks, you might have reader groups, uh, you quickly can blow into the megabytes range for just locks on your ads tables. So it's somewhat um, to be negotiated what the perfect number is. Um, yeah, so maybe this is a problem with the backends used. Why are we using these weird hash tables that need these kind of bucket locks? Why do we, need, uh, why do we use ordered sets that have problems? We can fix them, but these are not exactly new data structures from 1962 and 1980. Um, so, we tested a concurrent skip list. Uh, it's not log-free, it's not optimized, it's highly experimental. And what we got on 32 cores is just lookups. We see it's slow, but it scales. And at 16 cores, it starts being faster than the current audit set, and a skip list is an audit data structure, so it absolutely could serve as a replacement if it wasn't that slow. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, not for lookups, but for updates. 10% updates, 90% lookups. You can see ordered set is not a good choice, whereas the skip list based at spec end just keeps scaling. And if we start to enable hyperthreading on this benchmark, uh, we are faster than set now. So using different backends is definitely an option and uh, will be investigated further. And of course, one could argue that just this hash table could be improved as well, but we haven't looked into that too deeply yet. And this skip list will not end up in your ads. It's far too slow in the sequential case. No worries about that. <laughs> okay, so the question of this talk is, does scaling ads exist? You will be the judge of that in the end, I guess. Um, we have identified a few problems like ordered set that can be fixed or maybe replaced with something else. Locking is still a big problem, but it got much better. Recent versions of the runtime system deal with this much better. Numa is a problem, and I think it hasn't been on the radar too much previously, and it is probably the biggest problem that scalable ads will have to deal with in the near future. Uh, and reader groups may not be as important as one would have thought when just seeing them. They get some benefits, but on these graphs, the difference wasn't that huge. So what are the lessons we learned from really looking into this? On NUMA systems, you want to use pinning. The memory communication cost otherwise is just too high. 
on all of the tests I did without pinning, I just ended up in the worst case for any number of schedulers. Uh, when running on a server where you have other applications, you might want to scale down the number of schedulers and just dedicate half your machine to Erlang, something like that. It's probably more work for the admin, but it works much better, so <laughs> you should consider that. Um, when only doing lookups, you can use read concurrency, and as soon as you have updates, you should consider using write concurrency instead if you have a set bag or duplicate bag. And if you really want to combine them, you should measure what's the best option for you. I do not have any kind of boilerplate recommendation on that. Measuring is possible. Start with just write concurrency. And yeah, so what can we do? Increasing the number of bucket locks can help scalability. You can change that in the code. It's a single line. More than 256 will cause some breakage in the code. So we certainly cannot go much higher than what we currently have. It will not scale to several thousands of cores with that. If we are lucky, we don't get machines like that. So I don't know. Anyone here with a thousand core machine? Yeah, OK, so currently not a problem, but it might be in the future. And we still have too many yeah, new data structure backends. Well, it's certainly a hot research topic, and uh, it wasn't that hard to plug in something new. So that's definitely something even we will look at. So it also helps at getting rid of these many, many locks. There is locks on the meta table. Then those can maybe re be replaced by atomic instructions. We have a patch for that. It's not fully tested, but possible. There are locks on the table. There are locks on the buckets. This can be improved either by better locking schemes uh, or just by data structures that don't need as many locks. And an interesting observation was that a good scaling ordered set implementation can outperform set. And the assumption that hash tables are always so incredibly fast is also something that might be intuitive, but is not always true. So sometimes you might want to consider switching over to whatever works best in your code and not what you think should work best. Um, yeah, any questions? Yes? Did you do any work comparing the amount of time that is uh, used to copy the data back and forth between the S table and the uh, heap compared to all these other things there? Um, so is that, is that overwhelming everything else, or is it negligible? Uh, uh, when uh, these benchmarks uh, insert a very, very small tuple, so we don't think we will have that problem, but we, we have so yeah. we, we didn't do any measure how costly it is. But we think that if the tuple is very small, then the copying might not be so expensive. It's the, mm. these all these benchmarks use a, a tuple with a single integer value in it. Right. So, yeah. Uh, for for uh, scalability, it will not be such a problem because you can uh, copy the tuple before you take any locks or something so like this. When, when inserting, this is currently not done by the code, but it's an optimization that will at some point happen, I guess. Uh, you can do the copying uh, operation for the insert outside of the critical section. You can copy tuples into the ads table in parallel. That's actually not a big problem. Uh, for copying out again, you only read the ads table, so you can again do it in parallel. It should not be a huge bottleneck. Unless, of course, your bottleneck is your memory bandwidth, but then you have an entire different problem. Then you don't care about any of this because really you're memory bound in your application. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing to look at as well later. Yes? What is determining the 
The, yeah, the, the complexity class of skip lists. Yeah, what do you have to keep in mind if you want to use them efficiently? So what things are expensive? What determines the cost of using this? Well, skip this particular skip list, uh, besides that it is an experimental data structure that didn't get a lot of attention for optimization, uh, the problem with skip lists usually is you have a fixed amount of levels you have to go through. So if the data structure is not really big, there are quite significant overheads for maintaining all these levels that you could potentially have for faster skipping so that you get logarithmic access to the final elements. That's, I think, the biggest problem you immediately get on any skip list, but the real problems depend on the skip list algorithm you use. And there are quite many by now. We chose a simple one to implement and not one that would necessarily be a good choice. Uh, and um, uh, when you implement a, a concurrent data structure, this skip list, for example, uh, the search uh, doesn't take any locks, but uh, then to make sure that it doesn't uh, read uh, memory that has been freed by another process, it needs to uh, communicate what it's currently reading somehow. And to do this, it uh, inserts memory barriers to make sure that other cores can see the writes. And uh, oh, in, it might be possible to improve, but in, in this implementation, you have a lot of these memory barriers that can be expensive. OK, any more questions? Everyone exhausted. I think everyone just wants to go out and drink beer or something. Yeah, OK. So let so us say that everyone is exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can take questions later, somewhere out in the bar. So give it up for these two guys. I think it was awesome.